Welcome to the Smarter Science of Slim, the scientifically proven program where you eat more and exercise less to burn fat and boost health. Eat smarter, exercise smarter, live better. I am so ready for that. Hey, everybody, Jonathan Baylor back with another Calorie Myth Show. And this is one of those very, very unique shows where I am as much excited to be a listener and a viewer of this interview as I am to be giving the interview itself, because today we are fortunate enough to be joined by one of my favorite authors, a gentleman who's been an inspiration to me for more than a decade. I'm a little bit starstruck. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to lie. He is the author of myriad wild wildly successful books my favorite of which is a whole new mind which i read right when it came out and it literally transformed my life his most recent book is called to sell is human and he is known as daniel h pink but we're just going to call him dan pink for today what's up dan how you doing uh hey jonathan thanks for having me good to talk to you well dan i i again i am and i and i, I intentionally wore a uh, a blue warm-up jacket to sort of match your sartorial choices there so welcome <laughs> well thank you so much well, well dan I, I personally again want to thank you for being on the show i i honestly read a whole new mind when it came out uh, many many years ago and it actually gave me a whole new mind so i personally right. want to thank awesome. you for that thanks Great. so love dan, to hear that. dan what i really wanted to dig into today because i'm sure a lot of our listeners are familiar with you and your work but what i think they're probably less familiar with is your journey and you <laughs> as a man and one of the things I observed <laughs> was right. your, 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 you know, your most recent book, you look at the cover, it's, it's beautiful. I mean, it's just, it's just like, wow, that is, a, that is a New York Times bestselling book. And then you go on Amazon and you see that your first book came out yeah. more than 12 years ago. The cover yeah. looks a lot different. And I could imagine there was a much different Daniel Pink writing that book. You've been at this for a while. What motivates you? Yeah, I haven't had that for a while. And, and you know, that first book, uh, Free Agent Nation, which came out in... 2001 um that was you know that wasn't the beginning i mean i was doing other stuff before that too so um so you know it's a a long I, i've been at this a very long time it's a, and it's a long and winding road and I, you know i started out working in i mean i started out on so many different kind of false paths i i went to law school thinking that that was a good thing to do. I decided that that was not anything that I wanted to do. So I graduated from law school unemployed um, as one of only three people in my law school class who graduated unemployed. Um, I, went, I started working in politics because that was something that I was keenly interested in at the time. And I ended up working in politics for, for a while, worked on a bunch of campaigns, um, did a little stint on Capitol Hill, uh, then in a sort of bizarre way, kind of fell into speech writing and did political speech writing for a while. And then couldn't stand that. Um, uh, I mean, I just got sick of politics, and so decided to go out on my own. So you know that the the um, in the in the story of my life, such as it is, that first book, Free Agent Nation, is not chapter one. It's like chapter five or something yeah. like that. So um, so I guess what motivates, and it and it goes directly to your question of what motivates me, because I think for a lot of us, myself included. Yeah, I mean, I, I always try to extrapolate from my own personal experience because I don't, I'm not that special. You know, I feel like if, you know, if I think a certain way or if I have a certain experience, it's probably not wildly unique in the human race that my experience reflects other people's experiences as well. And I think what happened is over time, I finally figured out what it is that I felt comfortable doing, that I felt good about doing, that I enjoyed waking up in the morning to do um, something that matched my own interest. Uh, match my own skills, uh, and that I felt, you know, offered some modest contribution to the world. Uh, but that was not something I came out of the womb knowing. That was something that I finally kind of ever so slowly in a stumbling way zeroed in on when I was in my early 30s, mm -hmm. you know, early to mid 30s. So, um, and I, you know, I, I know despite my um, incredibly youthful, vibrant look. Uh, I'm going to be 50. I'm going to be 50 years old on my next birthday. Wow. So again, I've been I've been around for a while now. Dan, at its core, and having read all of your books, I can I can speak to this personally. I, I consider. No, I want to say no no relative except for my wife can make that distinct. Can make that <laughs> I wish I were kidding. I'm actually not kidding about that, but. Well, well, so that, that's really where my, where my question is going. I consider you to be very much an artist in a sense that so exactly. many books that come out 
are derivative. And I really do not find your books to be derivative at all. I do find them to be innovative. But that's an uphill battle. I can imagine that throughout this journey, there have been a lot of people who have been like, yeah, not really, not really so sure about that, or, or just have frankly disagreed with a lot of what you've, you've said. How, how do you oh, sure. overcome yeah. the naysayers? Oh, yeah. No, but I, but I think that's, I mean, yeah, of course, there are going to be people who say, I don't agree with you. You don't know what you're talking about. There are going to be people who, you know, um, um, you know, a handful of people who offer one star reviews and online book reviews. I, you know, that's I mean, I don't like it, uh, yeah. but, you know, that's that's the it's just part of the game. You know, I mean, it's part of it. it you know, you can't you can't say, oh, I'm going to put my ideas into the public domain. I'm going to try to, you know, take in this incredible act of of, of ego and self-absorption. I'm going to suggest that what I'm thinking, the ideas that I have, the suggestions that I have are worth other people considering. And but the rules are that no one can disagree. I mean, it doesn't you know, it doesn't work that way. So you have to you know, if you get into the you know, it's sort of to use Teddy Roosevelt's paraphrase Teddy Roosevelt's line. I mean, if you get into the arena, you're going to take some, you're going to take some hits and that, and that's, you know, nobody relishes that, but you can't say, Oh no, I'm not, I don't allow that. And so, um, you know, if there, I just think that the naysayers are part of the conversation. And fortunately, I don't, I don't think I've had a, you know, any sort of uh, outrageously large number of naysayers, uh, more than any, you know, more or less than anybody, more or fewer than anybody else. But it's part of, you know, it's just, it's just part of the territory. And, mm -hmm. you know, I also want to just say a positive word in favor of the naysayers, because um, the naysayers at some, well, uh, at some level, the skeptics uh, uh, at some level keep you on it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, every once in a while, they have a good point. And it's something to, you know, it's something to consider. But I don't, I, I, I don't lose, you know, I listen respectfully. I try to engage if people are being um, equally respectful and uh, think about what they're saying. And sometimes I disagree with, a lot of times I disagree with them. Every once in a while, I don't. And that's how the system works. So we're, we're now, sounds like about 20 plus years into this journey you've had of, of changing the world through your written word and through your spoken word. And obviously there's a lot of people that say positive things. We've talked about there's some people that say negative things. What got you through the early days when no one was saying anything? And it yeah. was just Dan. <laughs> That's a really good point, actually. And, you know, the the um, I think the real problem that that that, that writers face uh, isn't opposition, mm -hmm. isn't disagreement. It's obscurity. It's exactly <laughs> as you say. It isn't that people love you, people hate you. It's that people don't notice. And um, and I think what you have to do in that regard, um, and, and I say this to, to writers at the beginning, is you just got to go. First of all, you got to do stuff, stuff that you believe in and stuff that you're proud of, regardless. OK. Don't try to game the system and say, oh, I think this is going to be popular. I think that's going to be a hit because you're probably going to be wrong, number one. And number two, if you're not doing anything that you really care about and believe in, you're probably not going to do it all that well. Mm. And so you've just, by the quality of your work, diminished the chances of it being a hit. Mm -hmm. And so my view is just, you know, do great work, do something you, you believe in and don't and, and, and recognize that don't look for a quick fix. Don't mm -hmm. look for immediate gratification. It's a long and it's a long and winding road. It's a long and winding road. And so you have to do something you believe in, do it well and take, you know, um, uh, I mean, there were times, I mean, when I, I remember on my first book, I went to a, um, uh, an event, a book event at a, at a big, it was at a Barnes and Noble in, um, Henderson, uh, Nevada, outside of uh, Las Vegas. So pretty big metropolitan area book in uh, Henderson, uh, Nevada. And, you know, here it was seven o'clock at night on a weeknight and three people showed up. Mm. Okay. And so you have all the, they have chairs for 50, three freaking people show up. I'm there in front of three people. Then in the middle, then I start talking to these three people and one of them says, Oh, I'm sorry. I think I'm at the wrong place. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, one third of the audience didn't even, wasn't supposed <laughs> to be there. And so and so what do you, you know, so that's, that, that's not exactly an ego boost, but what do you do in those kind of circumstances? What you do is that you treat those two people who've taken time out of their day to show up as well as you possibly can. You do everything you can to enlighten and, and educate even those two people, because you know mm -hmm. what, at the beginning stages, those two people might talk to two other people. Now you have four. Mm -hmm. And when you walked in there that night, you had zero. Mm -hmm. And 
the game hasn't changed entirely. Things haven't tipped yet. But you keep doing that over and over and over again, and then you actually can make a difference. And you use the word tip there. Has that been your observation? There's this 10,000 hour thing that Malcolm Gladwell talks yeah. about and a lot of other people talk about. Did you find in your own career, because obviously your work has subsequently tipped, but did you, was it linear? Was it exponential? Was there a moment when you feel like, how, how did your uh, rise take place? Well, thank you for calling it a rise, first of all. Um, I think that, um, You know, I think it's a good it's a good question. I actually haven't thought about that much. Um, I, I think it's just more slow and steady. I don't think there was a tip. I, there definitely wasn't a tip. It was just, mm -hmm. you know, one person who was interested became two people who were interested. Two mm -hmm. people who were interested became four people. Four people became six people. Six people became seven people. Seven people became nine people. <laughs> you know, just oh, slow, slow and slow, slow and steady. I mean, I've always been both in the way that I think about my own work, my own kind of work habits, mm -hmm. uh, and I guess my own expectations for things. Um, you know, I've always been a tortoise, not a hare, yeah. not even close. I, and you know, the good news about that is that the tortoise won. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like there's a, there's a huge, so it's been more of a tortoise. It's been more of a tortoise rather than a, you know, kind of a, a, a tipping point or, um, 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 you know, where you're in one situation and then there's just, something happens and then there's like a step change or yeah. some kind of exponential leap. It, you know, it's more like, you know, slow, slow, <laughs> you know, and at some level the rise is so slow, it becomes yeah. each individual going from T1 to T2 to T3 to T4. That slope is very, very, very modest and mm -hmm. it's almost imperceptible, but over time it actually goes up. So we, we live in a, in a hair, in contrast to a tortoise culture, obviously. And we hear all these stories of American Idol, oh, my moment, my shot, I get it, and then everything changes. And it's this, this culture of immediate gratification. Yeah. What you're describing is the opposite of immediate gratification. You go to a, a rural town, three people show up, one person isn't even supposed to be there. How, how, are, you, how are you gratifying yourself along the way to keep yourself going if that external reward just isn't so immediate and obvious? It's difficult sometimes. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say that it's an easy path. I think that the key is to say, is to, is, is, is a bunch of, I guess there are two, be more directive here. Mm -hmm. I think there are two big factors. One is your expectations. Mm -hmm. um, you go in, if you go, if you go in thinking that, you know, anybody who writes a book, any, any book that comes out immediately becomes an instant hit, you're going to be in for a big disappointment. <laughs> If you if you if you go in and saying that if you write a book, it's actually really, really hard to break out. Mm -hmm. And if you do break out, it might take a long time. You have a very different set of expectations. Um, that's that's one thing. The second thing is goes back to what I said earlier, is that you, know, you have to do something that you believe in. You have to do something that you care about. Mm -hmm. If you don't if you're writing about something you don't ultimately don't care about or you don't really believe in, it's hard to sustain yeah. the two person event followed by the two person event followed by the two person event. If you're doing something you actually care about or interested in and believe in, then it's actually much less difficult. I love this, uh, doing what you're passionate about, doing what you're interested in and believe in. And you're kind of difficult to put into a box in terms of what you're interested in other than changing the way people think. What, what is it, like what do you see as the common denominator among your work that motivates you? Well, I mean, I think there is a, a I don't know, it's sort of a common thread, I think, which mm -hmm. is that I am keenly interested in, always have been, uh, in work. Mm -hmm. um, why people work? What do people do at work? Um, how do people get along with each other at work? Uh, when do people do their, you know, their best work at mm -hmm. work? Um, and, and I think that, you know, that, that we, in some level, we, we sell work short um, as an important component of people's lives. If you just look at it, if you just look at the arithmetic of it, we spend typically ha over half of our waking hours at work. Mm -hmm. And so for human beings, certainly, you know, middle class human beings in the West, it becomes this incredible window into humanity itself. Mm -hmm. What makes us tick? Why we do what we do? How, where, we're, where we get gratification? Where we're frustrated? How things happen? And so for me, work has always been endlessly interesting. I mean, I have here on my, I'm sitting here at my desk 
I have her on my desk, this book, you know, that I read when I was 10 years old that my mom brought home from the, the, um, the library. It's called Working by Studs Terkel. And it's a book from 1974 that, um, where Studs Terkel um, just went around and he talked to people about the work. Talked to, I mean, you know, if you look in the index here, it's all indexed by uh, people's, uh, it's all indexed by people's profession. So you have, let me just see here, you have um, uh, the farm worker, the farmer, the strip minder, the spot welder, the, the uh, plant manager, the cab driver, the hotel clerk, the football coach, et cetera, et cetera. And all these people just talk about their work. And even as a 10 year old, um, I find that I've been, I found it really just endlessly fascinating. And I still do hearing people talk about their work. What do you do? Um, what's it like? And again, I, I, I just, so if there's a thread, it's that every single book I've done has been about work. And you used uh, work and then you used the term what you do. How do you delineate or do you delineate work from, let's say, purpose? Interesting. Um, I think it varies from indi interesting question. I think it varies from individual to individual. I think that um, um, I think for some people there is a. Um, um, if you look at it like a Venn diagram, OK, mm -hmm. so it's sort of like what you know, what's your purpose and what's your work? And I think for some people, they're completely distinct. I think for some people, there's a modest overlap. For some people, there's a bigger overlap. Mm -hmm. And um, and what what concerns me and just in terms of people, um, their own satisfaction day to day in life and their own ability to contribute. Uh, I think if they're completely different, it's it's not it's not good. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I, but I think that there needs to be some overlap. And depending on the individual's you know preferences, predilections and things like that. You know, it doesn't have to be a, a complete overlap. There are people who get their their purpose in, out in sort of non-work realm. So they mm -hmm. might get it through their church or their synagogue or their mosque. Uh, they might get it from coaching youth sport, sport. They might get it from volunteering in their community. Although mm -hmm. I would argue that those things are kind of sort of like work too. They're just unpaid work. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so yeah, but I, I think people need to have some overlap. I, I think it's hard to sustain yourself if there's not some overlap. How overlapping is your work with your purpose? I think I got a pretty good overlap, but I'm not, you know, completely, it's not, it's not completely overlap. There's some things that, um, there, you know, I, I always, it's something that I, it's something that I wonder about. And I don't think it's a, it's a, it's a fixed state. Mm -hmm. That is, I think it's always, I think it's always in flux. And if one sees the circles coming too far apart, that's a sign that one should do something or mm -hmm. do something different. Speaking of doing something and doing something different, obviously this has been a long and, and very successful journey up to this point, which is well-deserved. What's next for you on this journey? Well, it's interesting you asked that in context of your previous questions. What I'm doing right now is, uh, well, my next big thing is um, for the first time ever, um, I am starting in July of, this, of 2014, I'm gonna take a six month sabbatical mm. and I'm not gonna be doing my regular work. I'm not gonna be um, I'm not going to be, my, my life has sort of two modes, hunkered down, writing and researching and interviewing, and then going, and then another part is like going out and talking about what I found out, you know, doing interviews and going out and talking to three people in Henderson, Nevada about it. And, 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 um, so what I'm going to do is actually take a little bit of a, of a, a, a breather, a refresher, a charging station. Yeah. And for six months, uh, not travel for work and not do not immediately start writing another book and just um you know part of it hang out with my family mm -hmm. and really think through in a strategic way some of what i want the next big project to be oh that's that's very cool what I, I also wanted to give you the opportunity dan as i know uh, at least from my experience as an author you got a book coming out the book comes out you got to talk about that book and then another book comes out you got to talk about that book if you could weave together the past 20 years of research and interviews into like this, remember Dan Pink for this observation or this insight, what would that be? No pressure. Well, I, mean, I, think, I, think you can take, I think you can take two of the, I think you can take two of the core ideas in, 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 um, in, in two of the books. I mean, I think that um, whole new mind, the, the big idea there is that we're moving from a world where the core abilities are these SAT spreadsheet, linear left brain abilities to one where the most important abilities are these artistic, empathic, inventive right brain abilities. That's mm -hmm. 
you know, fairly succinct way of describing that book. And then if you look at the book Drive, it, it, it shows that we've really oversold carrot and stick motivators and undersold autonomy, mastery and purpose as motivators. Mm -hmm. And then, um, uh, you know, to sell as human is that like it or not, we're all in the persuasion and sales business today. It's a big part of what we do, but we're doing it on this entirely remade landscape because of changes in information. And the way to do it better is to be actually more human about it, to be a better person rather than a more duplicitous person. So that's, you know, that's, that's three out of five right there. <laughs> well, Dan, when I, when I think of what you just said, when I think of your work, it, it reminds me really of a combination of a renaissance and the old uh, Greek philosophical times where individuals are really involved in, in art and deep thought and, and human connection more than uh, like, let's say laying brick or, or being treated like computers or farm animals. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a good, I mean, I, I, I appreciate that uh, observation. I mean, I appreciate the generosity of that observation, but I also think, I also think, I mean, again, I'm biased. I, I think that's a very accurate observation. If mm -hmm. there is a kind of conceptual thread that goes through, it's that when you get to the heart of it, when you get to um, um, the essence of what it means to enjoy work, what it means to contribute at work, what it means to be productive and creative at work, what it means for an organization's architecture mm -hmm. to promote those kinds of things. What you see over and over again, both anecdotally, both as you peer into the future, both when you look more deeply into the existing social science research, that what we have to do more than anything else is create workplaces, jobs, organizations that run with the grain of human nature mm -hmm. rather than against it. Mm -hmm. And I think that there is a degree right now in our world where this very humanistic approach to work, going, you know, people doing things that are fundamentally human is actually the pathway to doing things a little bit better. And I don't think that was always the case. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think the observation is good. It might have been the case or it might have been our at least modern interpretation of the case long, long ago. Mm -hmm. But I think right now there is this kind of convergence between the humanistic values of treating people well, of having empathy and understanding other people's perspective, of being good in all senses of the word that actually make one more effective at work, not less. Brilliant. Well, Dan, where can we go to learn more about you and to grab a copy of your most recent book, To Sell as Human? Just go to danpink.com, D-A-N-P-I-N-K.com. I'm also on Twitter, at Daniel Pink. Um, I've got, um, you know, a good way to stay in touch with some of the things that I'm reading and thinking about is uh, we have a, I have a, um, a semi-monthly-ish, irregular, irreverent <laughs> newsletter, uh, totally free, doesn't cost anything, no advertising that a lot of people really like. So I, I, I'll write about, here are 10 articles that I've read that I think you might be interested in. Uh, here are four apps that I discovered that I think are pretty cool. Um, so, you know, that's a very simple way to stay in touch with the kind of things that I'm writing about and thinking about. Brilliant. Well, Dan, thank you so much for sharing your time with us today and for sharing your insights with the world for the past 20 plus years. Thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. Awesome. Well, listeners, I hope you enjoyed today's conversation as much as I did. Again, our guest today is the brilliant Dan Pink. Definitely go check out his website, subscribe to his newsletter. I do personally, and it is fabulous and well worth your time. And remember, this week and every week after, eat smarter, exercise smarter, live smarter, and live better. Chat with you soon. Wait, wait, don't stop listening yet. You can get fabulous food same recipes over at carrybrown.com. And don't forget your 100% free eating and exercise quick start program, as well as free fun daily tips delivered right into your inbox at baylorgroup.com. That's B-A-I-L-O-R group.com.